Um, this is uh, Hardware Black Magic, building devices with FPGAs. Um, my name is Rodney McGee, I'm just the first speaker. Um, everybody up here should be in at least some point interacting with you. This is a three hour talk, kind of a long talk for DEF CON, but we try to have enough uh, demos and stuff to keep it interesting. So, our, our research group is um, uh, called Seaborg. We're from the University of Delaware. It's in Newark, not Newark, that's New Jersey. Um, so our interests actually are in um, custom hardware, high, high speed interconnects, basically designing custom chips. Um, we do a little reverse engineering, a little hardware red teaming, security, and a um, couple members of a group that works with us do network security. Um, Actually, at Sevor, we try to learn things outside of our discipline. We find that it gives us a lot of inspiration that really puts you ahead of other people who, who are just learning by the book. I mean, believe me, we have a lot of books, but you, you have to kind of put things together in a way that really give you insight into do something novel. So, and we're all about hardware. Even if it's about software, we still always come back to hardware. Um, traditionally, a lot of DEF CON has been focused on hardware, but if you've been to the CON the last couple of years, you notice there's been more hardware and a lot of emphasis on learning hardware every year. Um, one of the things we like to say is, you know, fundamentally, no matter how good your software is, you cannot do a secure implementation on fundamentally unknown or insecure hardware. You, you can't make any assumptions, no matter how many levels of abstraction you have. If your hardware is flawed, um, there will be some vulnerability introduced there. So, and the reason why I said here, fight to understand how your hardware works is because a lot of, a lot of you are probably big open source guys, um, and you understand the dangers and the pitfalls of closed source software. And, but a lot of us easily accept almost as a cost of doing business, closed source hardware. You know, using hardware that you basically understand nothing about, have no data sheets for, maybe you don't even know its function. And that's something that is, is not completely unavoidable like closed source software, but I think we can make it the kind of strives in hardware that we've made in the open source community over the last years and really um, introduce a whole new level of understanding for hardware for the masses. So. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today, specifically to kind of get there, um, is FPGAs. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have put firmware on things, maybe edited firmware, you know, done something custom, make something do something that it wasn't meant to do. Um, HDL, Hardware Descriptive Language, basically lets you design the hardware that you want, not the hardware that you have. Um, FPGAs are flexible in that way. So we're actually going to be covering a lot of different things. Um, I'll be covering basic FPGA and digital technology. Uh, we're actually going to be having um, contests throughout the thing for like giveaways. We got um, some FPGA demo boards. We got some Intel swag. We got some, um, and we actually have a netbook that we got from Intel to give away. And that'll actually be the last talk there. We're going to go through um, the Xilinx software for designing FPGAs. We're going to show demos for that. We're going to show GHDL, which is actually an open source way that you can learn how to code um, hardware descriptor language. Um, then we're going to talk about the EDK, which is the next level up and far as it's a little bit more uh, extract. You can actually write C code that runs on an FPGA. Um, and then we're going to talk about, um, Furcon's going to talk about uh, running Linux on an FPGA. and we're also going to talk about um, hardware from Altera, or actually software from Altera, and some hardware demo board that they sent us. And at the very end, we'll announce uh, who won the netbook. So let's start out with what is an FPGA. So an FPGA is a, obviously it's a semiconductor, it's a chip, but specifically it's a field programmable gate array that contains logic, box, logic blocks that can be reconfigured. Um, this basically allows an FPGA to be any kind of device you can imagine, obviously within the constraints of the actual FPGA itself. Um, there is speed limits, there's complexity limits, and um, the more you spend on FPGA, the more you'll basically get out of it. Um, FPGA design covers 
modern FPGA design. This is, this is kind of new. It actually covers hardware and software design. So that's why I started talking about the EDK. You can actually write C code that runs on a microprocessor that you actually instantiated on the chip. Um, and so if you're not familiar with FPGAs, you may not know that they're in a lot of different things. Um, if you have Verizon Fios, every one of your set-top boxes has an Altera FPGA, even in the uh, HD boxes. Um, lots of networking equipment uses FPGAs, and the reason why they do that is for flexibility. Um, a lot of times you'll have a card that'll plug into the front, and on the back plane, they'll actually have FPGAs that could basically allow it to be a totally different networking standard. Um, also boring things, even like printers have FPGAs. Um, if you're, if you, um, another talk going on right now is the GNU radio talk. Pretty much every software defined radio, or most really good ones, have a FPGA on them and lots of analog di digital converters, digital to analog actually. And even like large integrated systems like an F22, you might think, well, they have the budget to design their own chips. They don't have to use Phil Grammel chips. But actually, the flexibility that FPGAs give you, they'll even use them on projects that you have a, lot, a large budget for. So you can find them there. And one of the other uses for FPGAs is hardware accelerator cards. Um, ShmooCon is actually a hacker conference out in DC. Um, and a couple years ago, a guy gave a talk on cracking WEP and WPA keys with FPGAs. Um, and you can see the uh, s um, speed up there between, this is like just running on a PC, there's two different processors. Uh, there's a PS3, which has actually like six, S, what they call SPUs for doing parallel processing. And there's um, actually a, f a fairly middle of the road, kind of low end FPGA, and that's how many keys it's able to get through. And the same story with WPA. Um, there's actually the different, two different models of complexity of FPGAs. They're just basically about the same size, but they have more uh, parallel units in them that you can take advantage of. So FPGAs can basically, help you a lot in, in that kind of sense. So what are your choices for digital system development? Well, you can, you can get a high-end processor. Um, they're really easy to write code for. I mean, there's endless uh, languages and endless um, environments that you can code for processors. Um, the newest and the best ones are expensive. Um, the performance, it, when I say okay, what I mean is normally on a processor you're not utilizing the whole thing. Even if you're utilizing all the cores in your modern processor, there's a lot of units that are sitting there unused. And they can be fairly power hungry when you're actually using them. Um, not when they're, of course, when they're, they've come a long way with sleeping and um, for laptops, being able to get a lot more hours out of your usage. And then there's something kind of new, actually, that's coming about in the next couple of years is specialized parallel hardware. Of course, OpenGL has been around forever. But that was very specific usage. That allowed you to do uh, massively parallel video systems. So, you know, basically playing games, doing uh, 2D, 3D rendering. Um, but something new kind of is um, NVIDIA came out with CUDA. And it got standardized around OpenCL. Um, and what that allows you to do is basically bring the power of the parallel processor of a video card into the desktop world so that you can basically take advantage of the hundreds of different parallel processing units on a, and a video card to basically do operations that are not very single threaded. Um, and if you know that next to the processor, these things can be like pretty hefty power, power hungry monsters too, actually. And, um, but the, what you're somewhat restricted is, is the structure. They're still fundamentally designed for doing video card stuff. So if your parallel problem can be fit into that kind of problem, then they're great. But if not, then you're, you're going to run into some flexibility problems. So um, that's, that's actually kind of exciting. And for a lot of people, that's going to bring a lot of parallel performance to computers over the next couple of years. And actually, the next option here is an ASIC, which that's basically a custom chip. So big companies who do high volume, they design their own chips that do exactly what they want them to do. The, they're very high performance. They're, they're basically the best performance you get. The entire chip is optimized for doing one specific thing or a few specific things very well. Um, they're expensive to manufacture unless you're making millions of them. And so in that sense, they're kind of out of the reach for the individual. And then there's um, FPGAs. So you, once you buy them, you program them. They're obviously easier to design. 
they're high performance if uh, your problem can be parallelized, that is. And um, for doing the same job, they're lower power than a processor. So in embedded design, um, an FPGA pretty much can do all of this area. Uh, all of its, and you can even do it within the FPGA design tools. Um, you can substitute out parts that you want there. But fundamentally, um, the only layer you're not messing with is basically making the PCB board that you actually put them on. And of course you can do that too, but that's, that's, uh, that's up to you. And so FPGAs is kind of very vertical in that sense where you can do um, a lot all the way from the bottom to the top. So when you design FPGAs, you start out with what you want to do. You can either actually enter a schematic. You can actually have the series of digital logic gates that you actually want to make. You take them and you can actually put them in a schematic or you can write HDL source code. Um, and then you have a series of tools basically. Uh, these tools are kind of like they have analogs in the real world. That's basically, you know, like uh, logic analyzers and, and things like that that basically make you to be able to debug your very complicated designs. Um, and the way you test them um, is you use test benches. And this is a lot like, uh, you, this is actually a lot of you who've learned coding over the last couple of years, this is like a big thing they do now, test-oriented programming. And there's basically two big languages in HDL. There's VHDL and Verilog. So let's start out with something fairly simple. If you've never seen VHDL before, I'm going to try to uh, walk you through it. Um, this is basically kind of in C, kind of the libraries you're using. There's only a couple standard libraries that come with HDL. They basically do some simple things like you can do adding and handle certain uh, data types. This here you can think of as like the .h file. This kind of says like what function, what basically inputs and outputs you have out of a digital entity. And you can see here that we have a A, B, C, D that are both inputs. They are single bit, which is why they're standard logic. You have S there, which is a, a, actually a vector. You can think of that as like an array, pretty much the same thing. It's actually only uh, two bits, which you can see those two bits right there. And this is uh, the output. So this is a four to one mux. So basically, you put your, your signals coming in here, and then you select them with these S bits, and then you get out what's on Z. Pretty simple. And this is actually the code for the HDL. So uh, this is what they call architecture in VHDL. And so basically, you can see the cases here. If it's 0, 0 on the select bits, you'll get A. If it's 0, 1, you'll get B. Um, and you could either say 1, 1 or others here. This is kind of like whether you have a else or, a, or just a series of ifs. Um, and the most important thing here is this, this code is not if there was more code here, it would be more clear, but this code is not executed sequentially. This is not like C. This actually happens in parallel on all of them at the same time. So this, this line up here, process, is actually pretty important. Even if you don't have it here, it's kind of implied. Process actually says when any of these things change, this code, so to speak, should re-execute. Or in other words, the output should change. So this is actually how you control a whether or not, when, when a new value comes in. You could also have a clock. This is actually asynchron asynchronous logic, which means it has no clock. This is the other language called Verilog. Very, very similar idea, same implementation. Here's the basically structure of what's inputs, what's outputs, what's the variable. Over here, you have the same implementation. This might be a little confusing, but what this actually says is, is a law, uh, base two, uh, what this is and, and that and whether those match and whether you get A, B, C, D. Same idea though. And look, there's actually the equivalent line to process. You have that in Verilog right there. Um, so after you write your code, you actually synthesize it. And what that actually means is when it takes it and it actually puts it into a series of gates that actually implement what you are trying to design. Um, and then you take those pieces, those logical blocks that you've developed, and then you connect them together into pieces that function together. And so that, that's actually called the net list. The next thing you do is um, implement your design. So now that you've actually kind of compiled it, if you will, you actually have to say, well, this is going on a specific FPGA. This FPGA has this resources available to you, and how do I map that design onto these resources? For example, some FPGAs have digital adders on them. 
Um, some of them have a limited number of them, but an adder can also be made up of a series of more basic gates. So this is going to take your design and actually put it onto a real FPGA. This is actually compiling it, you know, for a specific architecture. It would kind of be the same idea if you're if you're taking the C analysts of things. And the place and route is pretty important. That actually is how you connect the different logical pieces on your board to other pieces. And one more, one more important thing is eventually you're going to be outside of the FPGA, and then you need to know your I.O. standards of what you're interfacing with. Actually, that's something you need to consider before you even select an FPGA is, does this have the number of I.O. pins I need to be able to do what I want to do? And most of the time, um, you can only you cannot mix different I.O. standards on what they call a bank, which is a grouping of I.O. pins. And so you need to kind of plan out before you select an FPGA which one that you're actually going to go with and make sure it does and has the number of output pins you need. And actually what I wanted to say here is that each step where it actually is getting closer to the real implementation, you're actually getting more real world numbers into here. For example, you're actually, after mapping, you'll have a what they call a clock to state propagation delay of 1.2 nanoseconds. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means after you change the inputs, when do the outputs come out to the place where you expect them to be? And then as you get farther to the actual real design, this is actually going to increase. You know, like, so this thing has so many gates in it. It's, and how long does it take to get from the input side to the output side? Well, then how long does it take to get from where it's outputted to the next component that it's going to go to to get maybe to the other side of the FPGA? And of course, you're talking nanoseconds here, so uh, you are talking about numbers that matter for high speed. Then once you get your design ready, you're actually going to have to program your FPGA. There's a lot of ways to program an FPGA. There's JTAG, USB. You can program it with Flash. You can have other kinds of programmable memory. Um, you can have an FPGA program on boot. As some FPGAs, you can actually program, reprogram parts of them while they're running in some FPGAs if you look for those features so that you can dynamically adjust what actual digital circuits you're actually impl implementing uh, to kind of have modes, you know, basically, without actually uh, affecting the other side of the FPGA. And the rest of the talk is actually going to be, we're going to go through different softwares, hands-on demos. Um, it's basically the same idea, but it's going to be on different implementations or different, you know, different companies do things, call things different things. We're going to go through writing some simple um, VHDL, writing some C code for, well, not so much writing a C code, but showing how you would use the EDK. Um, and as a part of that, you actually see how to do high-speed interconnects between functional units. And I also want to say that you can get one of these demo boards for like less than $100. And you can spend a lot more on them also, just pretty much like anything. And we actually have a demo board over there that actually has a touch interface and a five megapixel camera, which is actually pretty cool. And like I said, um, we have some stuff that we'll be giving away too. So I think that's it for me. Now we're actually going to go to the Xilinx um, ISC. A contest, OK. So we're going to switch here. Be a lot of switching. Make sure you start the presentation. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I am uh, Corey Lang. I'm an undergraduate at the University of Delaware, and I'm going to be the one who's giving away stuff today. So when you see me, that's right. Yay me! Okay, let me get this thing up here. See it, maybe something. Did anyone read that really quick? Okay. Um, so how the contest is going to work, we're going to put a question up on the screen. You're going to have about five minutes to write down your name, a claim password that you're going to have to come up so we don't have you know five people named Spartacus coming up trying to claim the same thing, and your answer on a contest form. Um, people, uh, are my lovely uh, cohorts, all wearing Seaborg t-shirts, will be handing out slips and collecting them when you're done. And we will draw the winning slip from the correct answers, so it's kind of a lottery, but you have to get the question right to be entered. Um, the winner will be announced and you'll get your prize at the start of the next contest session. And disclaimer, we reserve right to be judge, jury, executioners in all contest matters and decisions. Um, also, you can take this time. We'll be having four of these throughout the um, talk, since it's a three-hour talk. Stretch your legs, get up, move around, 
but don't go anywhere because there's a lot of cool stuff. So up for grabs on this first contest, we have a Spartan 3E FPGA demo board, um, a couple, and some Intel swag, some travel mugs, and t-shirts. So um, will some of the Seaborg people will be around handing out entry slips. And the question for the first contest is, what is the approximate visible bandwidth of the human eye? So you guys have about, you know, 10 minutes, uh, five, 10 minutes to uh, answer questions and when we'll let you know when the contest is closed. Okay, um, just raise your hand if you want a contest slip. And we'll have a lot of people walking around, so. Actually, do any of you have any questions about the first? Yeah, question? if anyone has any questions, you know, stand up and stand up because we already have hands up. So yeah, so else. we're unless you want to raise both hands for a question, I don't know. So that'd be a little hard to for for this units. Um, give it in um, hertz. Give it in some kind of frequency, preferably hertz, or some you know scientific prefix with hertz. Nanometers is not okay, that's a wavelength. Do all of you have the question memorized? Can we change the picture? All right. Don't they? When this gets to okay. Actually, we're doing six. Like four minutes. Into our four minutes. Oh, one more minute. Hold on. One more minute. Huh? Yeah. That way we can, because the award will take an extra time. Just give them a whole lot of time. Let's say one more minute. Okay. So how do we collect them? Did you tell them how to collect them? Yeah. Just to have to. We're already collecting them. Right. Got to tell them to just start. Tell them to start passing them to the people to see what they're If you got an answer, keep your hands up and we'll get to you. I think we're going to start the next one now. All right. Cool. Hi, everybody. My name's uh, Tyrell, and uh, Ryan's going to be giving a demo. 
Um, so we're going to be talking about the Xilinx IC a little bit. So a uh, basic overview of the IC is it's, it's the program that takes your VHDL, your Verilog, your um, schematics, and it will turn it into, it'll give you the tools needed to turn it into something that your FPGA will understand, it'll turn it into the bit file. So the, the web pack is completely free. You can download it at this link. Um, I believe our slides are going to be up on our website. Yep. Uh, so here's some, here's some basic information on uh, the Spartan 3 board we're going to be demoing. Um, it's, it's got the XC3S500E Spartan FPGA. Um, two, uh, 232 uh, user I.O. pins. There's all kinds of memory with the PROM, DDR, SD RAM. Nor flash and zero flash, and then some other key things. It has a VGA uh, display port, uh, Ethernet, RS-232, and then some LED switches, push buttons. Here's a here's a quick uh, quick picture showing you where these things are. So when we give the demo, um, we're actually going to be showing the board up on the screen, so you can kind of see what's actually up on there. So uh, here's the design flow for um, the Xilinx software. Basically, to begin with, you plan and budget out your resources. Make sure you have enough of uh, lookup tables, flip-flops, um, serial ports, Ethernet. Make sure you have everything you need to actually implement what you're trying to do. And then um, I'm sure a lot of you guys are programmers, so it's just basically writing the code. Um, and then you'll synth uh, synth synthesize it to create the net list, which uh, Ronnie talked about a little bit, and I'll talk about a little bit more. And then you do the functional sim simulation and implement timing sim simulation, make the bit file, and uh, configure the FPGA. Uh, so here's uh, what the IC looks like. It uh, has all the tools you need to perform every, all the steps I just showed in the design flow, which we'll talk about more in the next couple slides. So it's uh, pretty compact and everything's right there for you, makes it simple. So to begin with, you just uh, take your source type, which can be a schematic, um, state diagram, VHDL, Verilog. You got tons of options, which you can read on the side over there. And uh, then you, uh, you have to have a test bench. Um, the test bench is just basically how a lot of people will test their code by just putting random inputs in, making sure it comes back out the way they want it. So that's pretty much what the test bench is for, um, for all of this. So, um, like I said, you have to make a netlist file, which um, Xilinx has their own tool. They also have support for a lot of third-party tools, which can be nice at times. And uh, so this is the netlist file. Basically what this is, is um, over here, are where you see SW0 through 3 and LED 7 through 0. These are the logical names, so kind of like the variable names that you use in your code. Um, and these locations here are the actual spots on the board that are the traces where it'll hook up to. So when you see the board later, we'll show you L13 is right under one of the switches. So this Netlist file, when you um, process it, it gives it, it allows the FPGA to know whenever we talk about switch zero, um, that signal will go to L13. And uh, Ronnie talked about the IO standards. You have to list, list those. For all the ones we're um, using, we'll be using LVTTL. And then these are some, um, other options which are specific to whatever uh, piece of hardware you're using. So for the uh, implementation, you are going to be most likely using a lot of different pieces of hardware, which means there could be multiple netlist files. So to begin with, to translate it, you'll take all these um, all these netlists and make them, uh, put them together. This is because they're all going to be using the same board, same um, hardware set, so it makes sense to put them all together. So you can see how they interact. Uh, then the mapping is you'll take those logical, from the previous slide, you'll take the logical, the SW0 or the LED7, and you'll actually map them to the, the trace on the board. Um, and then you'll actually place and route, you make sure the connections um, are good on the chip and um, you'll get some timing data and some reports from that. Um, so for the configuration, you need to make a file that the FPGA understands, which in this case is a bit file. So you'll put it, you'll make a bit file, you'll download it to the board, which um, you can download it right to the uh, PROM, and it'll, it'll boot off that. Mm -hmm. It'll boot off that, um, 
and you can leave it there and turn it on and off and everything, the program will be there to run right off of that for you. Um, so this is uh, a little about the simulation. The add a test bench is basically you add a test bench to, with your input and you make sure your output's coming out like I said before. Uh, the behavioral simulation is where you will test just the logic. You'll make sure your, your units are, or your um, logical units are actually making sense. So if you have, if you say if switch one is high, then LED one should be on. If switch one and switch two are high, LED three should be on. You just make sure that works out how you expe uh, expected it. And the timing simulation is a little more tricky since we're working with hardware, not software. Um, as Roddy mentioned before, hardware is kind of working in parallel. When your signal gets hit, sent there, it's going to work. Then it's not going to it's not going to wait until the previous step. Um, like in software, you, you do this, and then you do A, then you do B, then you do C. So the timing simulation is you you may think you have everything working great, but then as soon as you put it through the timing, everything breaks up. So you have to make sure you get all the timing right and everything is going when you expect it to be going. Um, this is just a little bit about the design data. It's, um, nice thing is it'll give you reports in here. So over here is a list of all the reports, some options. And up here gives you a general overview of um, the project, the name, the target device, and that kind of things. Here um, is device utilization, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And down here are just some constraints you can uh, you can set and um, some more reports. So the uh, design utilization or device utilization can be nice because it'll show you what what you've already used in your design. So here you're using four uh, flip flops of the available 27,000. 27,000, so you only use 1%. So it's nice when you're making a design to make sure you're not using up all your resources. And if you need to go back and change your design and you see you're using up 99% of a resource, you can take that into consideration when you redesign to try to either redesign it and optimize it or redesign it another way so you can add stuff without using all your resources. So now Ryan's going to give a demo of all this um, with some switches and LEDs and then a nice VGA to show you that the VGA actually works. I also wanted to add that um, if you guys have any questions at all during this, this is kind of a long talk, so feel free to ask them even if during the demo sessions if you have just a quick question about something we said or just want to know something more. Okay, so I'm actually going to walk you guys through um, a, a very simple hardware design um, with the Xilinx ISC. So I'm going to go ahead and start that out now. So we're going we're gonna to basically create a, a design that just has some simple gates and uses uh, switches and LEDs. And uh, one of the most important things uh, when you're designing this is to uh, take into consideration what, what pins are connected where, like he was talking about the net list. Um, so for, in our case, we're using a, a demo kit board, not a custom design board. So they have all that stuff already mapped out for you, which is kind of nice. So we can just go here and say, okay, I, I want to use the switches, uh, the slide switches, and uh, say UCF location constraints, and actually we'll give you right the nets uh, that you need. And you can just select those and, and copy and paste them into your files. So we'll be, we'll be going back to that later. We're going to start a new project, and we'll just call it uh, Simple DEF CON. And uh, it looks like this is all set okay. Spartan 3E. Um, that, that is all actually written on the board. Uh, whatever demo board you have, you can just kind of take a look at it. Um, take a look at the FPGA in the center, and it has all this timing information and stuff like that. Um, and we're going to create a new source file. And we're just going to call it Simple LED. And that will be a VHDL module. We'll add that to the project. And this is where you you tell it basically what is coming in in this module and out of this module. Um, and in our case, that we're going to have switches that are going to be inputs, and they're going to be a bus. Um, and this is the most significant bit. We'll say three down to zero. So there's 
there's basically a vector of four inputs that are switches, and we can address them as like SW0, SW1. Um, and our LEDs are going to be our output. So we say direction out and a bus. There's eight of those, so we'll say seven down to zero. It's asking me if it exists. It doesn't exist. Do I want to create it? And no existing sources. I'll create a project. Okay, and then the next uh, most important thing is to create the uh, netlist file, the constraints file. So we say new source and uh, pick implementation constraints file. And I'm just going to call it constraints. And that's going to pop up here. And I'm going to say, they have like a built-in constraint editor, but it's easier to just do this in text uh, since Silinx already gives them to you. So you can say edit constraints, and we can just uh, copy this right from here, the switches, and paste it right in there since we called them the same thing. It's really important that your ports um, in your VHDL file have the same names as the nets in your constraints file because it, it uses those to map the two together so it knows that they're the same thing. Um, so then we're going to add the LEDs to that too. So we have discrete LEDs, UCF location constraints, and then we're just going to select all these. copy and paste them. So now we have our constraints file. These are the only things that we're going to interact with on the board at this point. And uh, now we can go ahead and write our, our VHDL file. It already kind of created an outline for us um, and it uh, added in the libraries that we're going to need uh, automatically. If you had any like custom libraries that other people write online, like you can go look up VHDL code online and there's a lot of other libraries you can add them in there. And uh, we're just going to write very simple VHDL code. We're uh, not even going to put a process in here because that's it's kind of implied. This is we're just going to directly map hardware. So basically what we're going to we're going to say now is uh, LED 0. We're going to we're addressing LED 0. We're saying that's going to be mapped directly to and then we can we can do whatever we want here. So I can say uh, switch zero, and I can actually uh, give it a, a hardware gate. So I can say is switch zero and switch one. <laughs> Let's find out. Is that better? Okay, so um, you can you can put in any kind of gate. Um, you're basically telling it exactly what uh, this is direct hardware mapping. So LED one is going to be connected to a gate of switch zero or switch one. LED three will say switch zero. Uh, exclusive or switch one LED four well, let's make this two three switch one and these last four I'm just going to directly map so We'll just say LED four is the same as switch zero. LED five is switch one. Is it case sensitive? Uh, no, it's not really case sensitive. I'm just trying to make them look the same. <laughs> I'm not easier, sure about Verilog, but VHDL is insensitive. Uh, 
Uh, most of them, yeah. He asked, uh, um, can you use like the standard stuff like uh, ampersands and pipes and things for ands and ors and stuff? So I'm going to save that, and uh, down in the processes section, um, I can go say configure target device. Um, so it knows to start by, with synthesis. So this is actually a pretty small design, so it's not going to take very long. But when you start getting more complex designs like AES encryption and um, like VGA controllers, it can take a little bit longer to synthesize and uh, place and route your design. But it's already done with synthesis. It's moved on to the uh, implement design phase. And there's actually subcategories in this, so you can kind of take a look. It's done with translating. It's moving on to mapping. Uh, processor, actually, yeah. The faster you have a computer, the, the better this process will go. Um, synthesis currently is mostly a single-threaded operation um, on, on uh, the IS, at least the Xilinx software, and I believe so with Altera also. So a, a Pentium, well, not so much anymore, but a year ago, a Pentium 4 might have done better than a slower core 2 because it didn't take advantage of the second one, but now I think the i7 would kick it kick its ass. <laughs> so now basically it's telling me Xilinx has this thing called Impact Project Manager, which is uh, basically uh, a project to help you program through whatever means uh, you have available. Here we're going to do it through JTAG. It's like a USB to JTAG uh, configuration, so it's going to scan and look for a download cable. And it found it. It, found, it finds the three devices that are on the Spartan 3 FPGA. So it knows there's a 3500SE uh, PROM chip on there and a CPLD. And you can see the FPGA is the first one. So we're going to say, OK, program with this bit file we just created. And we're just going to bypass the other two because we don't want to program them right now. We don't have any configuration for them. And we're going to say, OK, that's OK. And I'm going to click on this, uh, the FPGA, and just click Program. And it just programmed the FPGA. So now I'm going to actually switch this over so you can take a look at it, the, the video input. Those other three devices, those are the ones that you can use to have your FPGA program on startup. Um, the first thing on the chip on the left is the one where you can just program it instantaneously You know, while it's powered on. OK, so this is our, this is our demo board here. This is a demo board here. I'm just going to flicker on the switches so you can kind of see the reaction of the LEDs, basically what we just uh, wrote in VHDL. So these are the... So the, the two switches on the, on the left are switch three and switch four, and they were directly mapped, only the two LEDs. So you can see them turning on and off. And the first two are switch one and switch zero, which or switch zero and one, which we had all of the gates hooked up to. So you can kind of see the LEDs react to the, the different gate configurations that we had. Earlier you talked about test benching it. Would you have done that in software prior to uploading? Yeah, you can actually right. write your test bench before you write the code. Right, so what you would want to do, um, if you wanted to do um, simulation, that's where the test bench would come into play. Uh, you need a test bench to look to do a simulation, otherwise you don't have any input, so you're not going to see any output in simulation. You don't actually have to create a test bench if you just want to put it into hardware and, and check to see if it works. Um, but when you start to get into more complex systems, it almost becomes essential to create a some kind of test bench uh, so you can test individual modules of your system without having the whole thing hooked up and together. Other than uh, uh, it not working, would you damage the device? Um, usually the not. Yeah, he, he asked them, um, can, can you damage the device um, if it's not working correctly, or will it just not work? Um, most of the time, you, you really won't damage too many devices, but um, you, know, you could be connected to a component that takes uh, a much lower voltage level, and you're if you're pumping, you know, you have a constraint wrong, and you're pumping like three and a half volts into something that 
you know, isn't supposed to take three and a half volts, you can potentially mess something up. But yeah, I mean, if you're just dealing with the FPGA, it's pretty hard to write code that destroys it. Um, you can make it warmer if you do certain <laughs> things, but uh, I've never seen. I mean, if you saw our talk last year, we actually did a hardware trojan, basically making the processor hotter and colder based on certain operations we were doing. So. Um, you can definitely do things like that, but most of the time you'll get into trouble with interfacing things outside of the FPGA with your FPGA, and you're not uh, taking all the proper I.O. considerations. Okay, so I'm going to show you one other really useful thing um, with the Xilinx ISC. I pulled uh, some code off the internet uh, a couple days ago, just uh, some like VHDL example, uh, VGA example code. Um, that just uses a, a VGA port and a 50 megahertz clock. So I'm just going to do that real quick. Um, I'm going to implement that. I'm going to basically pull in the code that I, I got off the internet and put it into ISE and make it work with the Spartan 3E board. Um, and this was actually just written for the, the pins on a VGA connector. All you need is a VGA connector and a 50 megahertz clock and an FPGA. So you, you could do this on any board that has those three things, not just the Spartan 3E. Um, so we're, we're going to go through the same process, and um, I'm going to add in that source file here. And let's see, I put it here. It's called squares.vhd. Um, and it's going to copy it to this project. Yep, there's Linux yes. and used to be Solaris. Yeah. He asked if there's Linux version. Actually, the EDK runs better under Linux because it, it uh, when you install the EDK under Windows, it installs um, Sigwin. Uh, the Spartan th uh, 149. And if any of you are still in school or educators, you can get discounts from Xilinx. So we are um, giving away these boards actually, so you can win it for free right now. <laughs> so obviously, the first, the most important thing to do is to create uh, a constraints file first, and we have to have a constraints file that includes all of these inputs and outputs that are there in this uh, VHDL module that was that I, I we got off the internet. So I'm going to create another constraints file. I'm pretty sure it's it's a binary, so it, whether it runs on x86 only. The Linux version. So we're going to go back to the, the Spartan 3 again uh, user guide, and we're going to go to the, dis the um, VGA display port and pull down those constraints. Now the interesting thing here is that these are named differently um, because this is just code that's off the internet. So I'm going to dump this. Uh, the Spartan 3 constraints in here, but you can see that, um, or not see because it's like gray or something, but it says um, VGA red, VGA green, whereas in our VHDL module, it's called uh, red out, green out. So basically, if I compile this right now, it would not know that those are the same signal that we're talking about, and it wouldn't map them to the, the FPGA. So I have to make sure that those are named the same. So basically, I have to say, um, this is red out here that we're talking about. So um, I'm going to copy and paste red out into there and green out into the next one. Yeah. Blue. Those are specific. Um, he asked what slu and drive are. Uh, those uh, those kind of fields are basically very sp uh, specific um, tweaks to I/O standards. So uh, the slew would affect like how the the rise and the fall from a zero to a one transition would look like. What's the units for drive? Current. current. So last thing we have to add in here is the clock. Um, the Spartan 3 has 
uh, 50 megahertz oscillator on it. Um, the FPGA can pretty much take anything. I think there's a certain, there's like a, it maxes out at some point um, in megahertz, uh, what clock signal you can, you can drive in, into it. Um, but you can, you can pretty much drive any clock signal you want. So anything like 13 to 25 megahertz if you want. And the interesting thing about this is we're, we're feeding in a 50 megahertz clock because that's what the Spartan 3E has. But uh, the VGA standard actually uses tw a 25 megahertz clock. Um, so this is uh, clock 50 megahertz. So I'm just going to make this the same. So I'm going to save that constraints file. But you'll notice in this, in this VHDL file, um, we have a signal here it's, it's th that we created. It's kind of like a variable called clock 25. And then we have this process here. Um, so this kind of runs in parallel with, the other pr with any other processes that are going on. Um, and this process takes the 50 megahertz clock and turns it into a 25 megahertz clock, basically, that, um, that this VGA process needs in order to you know, operate it uh, the, the speed that the projector can take in. So we're done here because this, this is a pre-made module, and I'm just going to configure this a while. But if you take a look here, um, this is what VHDL is really good at. It's really good at taking things that need specific timing, um, where timing is crucial, and, and you can kind of uh, write in a very uh, easy to understand uh, language. So like if the 50 megahertz clock if a 50 megahertz clock event happens and uh, the 50 megahertz clock is at lo a logic signal one. So basically, if if we see a rising edge, then do this. Um, and likewise, you can see below, you just say, if, if this signal is at logic zero, now do this. So that's where VHDL comes in and really handy that you can't really guarantee timing with a microprocessor when you have want to do several things at once because you've got kind of got this multi-threading and you, you're never guaranteed to get um, a specific timing down. And the cool thing about these processes, there there's no scheduler. They're always on the CPU. They're always ready to trigger. There's no starvation. You basically have the entire resources of the board ready to trigger at any moment based on your design. So in, in that sense, it, it blows away a single-threaded CPU for timing that real world uh, real time programming is a joke compared to writing HDL. So I'm going to program the, the FPGA again real quick and uh, I'll actually plug this uh, signal in so you can see what it, what it outputs. So that's this this code that I downloaded off the internet. This is what it uh, outputs on the VGA uh, port. So it's basically just a bunch of squares. It's like a test signal, but uh, you can see. I mean, that's that's you know probably a page and a half of code to to put that out on your uh, VGA port. So it's you can see how useful the, the ISC can be. Um, yeah. yeah. For example, using uh, this VGA, imagine what you can do. Uh, you can basically write a game code, for example, and uh, run it uh, from your just Spartan 3 board, like this is a basic starter board, and play it without having any other like peripherals or other things. Yeah, we actually uh, do that in our senior design course. Um, uh, all the students wrote their video game. I mean, m most of them are varying degrees more comp more complicated than Pong, you know, less complicated than Mario, but um, that's that's the kind of stuff you can do with these boards. What semester is that senior course? Um, it's in the fall, yeah, the senior year. Senior. How many semesters of VHDL have they had? Just one. So this is uh, this is the the end of the demo for the ISC, and uh, I believe where we have to go in that one. Yeah, we have contest winners and uh, another contest. So Corey's going to come back up. Okay, so uh, we went through and uh, found out the uh, who got questions right and wrong, and we separated out the right answers. And we're going to 
draw some right answers. I'm going to have two of my colleagues, Steve and Mike, come up here and help us out. The right answer is approximately 400 terahertz. The human eye has about a 400 terahertz bandwidth. It's quite but, impressive. But we accepted anything that was kind of close to that, or at least within the band, up to uh, yeah, I think about 790 it. terahertz. So. Yeah, but we, we had to reject things like 60 hertz and bits per second and nanometers. So. Yeah, just because Google says that it's 10 million bits per second doesn't mean it was what yeah. we were looking for. Google isn't always right, but Wikipedia is. Um, so these guys are going to draw the answers and call out names and then you'll come up to me and give me your password and we'll uh, give you some prizes. All right, who's ready? Come on guys, wake up. All right. You ready? Let's get a little anticipation. First person is? Uh, this, this is for the Spartan 3 board. We're going to get that one knocked out right now. Tom. Tom. <laughs> this is why we have the Tom's password. Right here. I think it's me. <laughs> Wait, what? All right, come on. Do, do we have the? Is Tom here? Raise your hand if you're Tom. Nope. Close. Close. I mean, this hey, is Tom, a highly have... brute forceable password here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, we're going to draw another one. We're going to draw another one, but uh, this wouldn't make it past Jack the Ripper. Sorry. <laughs> Ah, uh, let's hope for a better, uh, so bad. cheese burrito. Yeah. Oh, cheese Woo. burrito is here, yeah. Cheese burrito is here, all right, he wins the Spartan three. Okay. Let's give him a round of applause. Yeah. All right. Cor Corey will authenticate him. <laughs> all right, what's, uh, what do we have next, Cor? Um, mugs. All right, we're giving away some mugs, all right, ready? Very exciting. Here we go. These are official from Intel. The winner is Vatman. All right, come on up. We need another one. All right, let's give him a round of applause. See, this is great. You guys come out early, you get to learn about FPGAs, you take some cool prizes home. It's a win-win. All right, next guy, Matt A. Matt A, All right. going once, going twice. Chris. <laughs> all right, all right, we need, we, what? It looks like a two? All right, all right, maybe. Cry two, I, I, I'm sorry. All right, uh, let's see. We got two Intel t-shirts. Uh, Dave King. Dave King. Is he on the, on the back? All right, coming on up. All right, round of applause. <laughs> Last but not least, ooh, that was a good one. Joel Voss. Joel, are you here? All right. All right, we got three more contests coming up, plenty of demos. We're trying to make the three hours go by a little smoother, but please, for your passwords, let's make them a little bit stronger. Hello does not count as a good password. All right, thank you. Okay, that's one contest down, but uh, fear not, because we got another one coming right up now. So. Um, we're giving away more prizes. We got another FPGA board. We got some Intel bobbleheads. Ooh, and some more t-shirts. So the question for number two, and same rules apply, guys. Look around for raise your hand if you need a slip and give them to the Seaborg. You don't even know what the question is yet. What are you raising your hands for? <laughs> it might be anyone raising their hands gives me $10 right now, you know. Um, actually, this is not really a question, but um, you see some VHDL code right up here. What does it do? And keep it simple. I don't want paragraphs of text. Although if you make me laugh, I might consider putting it in the drawing. Yeah, one word should be sufficient. One, one, word, one word should do it.
while people are passing things out, does anyone have any questions for Tyrell or Ryan over here about anything ISC related? Just kind of stand up and shout it out. No? What's the answer? Funny. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> Okay, well, actually, VHDL, um, probably most of the market uses Verilog, actually. Uh, but we, uh, we learned in VHDL, Verilog's pretty similar. The reason you use VHDL is if you do anything for the government, they require it, generally speaking. Um, and Verilog, some people say it's easier to learn. I, I, the syntax, they find it easier, but it's pretty much the same. If you don't have a slip in, sorry, yeah. if you don't have a slip and don't feel like waiting for one and you just have scrap paper, feel free to just write it down with name, I know password. That software that you actually pay for has very vast libraries of pre-created uh, hardware in it. Does this software have any of those? Yeah, it has some, it has some IP, what they, they call IP, um, intellectual property with it. Um, you can, some stuff you can actually use non-commercially for free. Um, some stuff you can buy, like MPEG-4 encoders, or you could find it online. Um, actually, a good source for libraries is opencores.org, I believe. They have tons of HDL code that you can just download and load up on your favorite FPGA. When is incremental synthesis going to work well? Um, when NP complete problems get easy, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> What's your recommended uh, best way for someone just getting into the hardware side of things with a lot of software experience? Any particular test score that you recommend? Or yeah, we did. He asked how to get started with this kind of stuff if mainly you've done software. I mean, it, if you've done parallel coding, you'll, you'll suddenly realize that a lot of the problems are very similar. You know, if you've wrote single printed programs, you might start beating your head against the wall because you, you need to have control over when, when things happen. So um, writing VHDL, it's completely parallelized. You need to have signals for when things happen. You need to have locks if you're having multiple things access the same resource. Um, so the, these boards are, are fine to get started. Um, I would recommend having a project that you want to do. I've seen YouTube videos of people programming an FPGA so it plays Guitar Hero automatically. Um, you know, uh, if you want to get started without any hardware, we're going to be talking about VH, uh, GHDL soon. Uh, but I think the really way to get interested is to say, you know, I, I have this little thing that I want to do that I think I can actually pretty much draw out how it should work. like. A lot, the way you actually really complex stuff, a lot of the computer science guys know it because it's finite state machines. You need to have good state machines. Like you should not have lots of nested if statements. You should have um, basically a state variable that kind of keeps you where you are in the current operation. Anything big like an AES core is going to use something like that. Um, a lot of the old rules with a lot of the kind of behind the scenes stuff in writing C kind of comes out to play when you're writing very complicated systems. Um, as for actually purchasing hardware, um, the two ma major manufacturers of FPGAs are Xilinx and Altera. Um, uh, one, of, one of our sponsors, Digilent, um, actually makes a variety of various FPGA boards um, of various complexities and whatnot that you could get. So I think we're finishing up There's with yeah. questions or? Yeah, actually, we just installed it. Um, we don't like how it, well, for the version we have it, it requires a network license. But if you get downloaded the free version, it doesn't. Um, it, it makes a lot of improvements. I haven't had a lot of sit down time with it to see what breaks from my, uh, the other version. but. Um, Overall, there's, it looks like a, a nice solid incremental build. Uh, right now, we're sticking with 10 for a while, but 11, we're installing 11 on some machines. You said there are software simulators. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll cover that, actually. Is that next?
Yeah. So that's where is it? Yeah. So we'll get to that. Does anyone need to see the thing up there anymore? Or can we move on? Corey's working his way back up here. It's actually his talk. And Steve is back there. OK, so I'm actually going to not talk about something contest related this time, which I'm sorry about, but we'll get back to it. Um, GHDL is a um, GNU VHDL simulator. If you don't have the money to shell out for a board, but you want to start playing around with VHDL, it's a great way to get started. It uses the GCC compiler technology. It's a command line interface. There's the URL for it if you want to download it. Um, completely free. I, the current version, I believe, is 0.26 or 0.27. We, um, we use 0.25. Don't ask me why. We just do. The beauty of this is, as it was explained, VHDL, DOD approved language, GHDL coded in ADA, another DOD language. So you're going to be doing a lot of compiling. Sorry about that, but there's a lot of binary packages out there. So just a heads up. So why use VHDL? Obviously, it's free. It's easy to download and use. Um, if you have Linux, there's a, people have tried to compile it for SIGWIN, and it just fails miserably. I don't know why. But there is a Windows version of it. I couldn't get it working, but. You guys might do better than I did. And there's no FPGA required, so it's literally free. You don't need any to shell out any money whatsoever. Um, I'm also going to talk a little about the MIPS architecture, which probably most people know about. It's a simple 32-bit RISC architecture um, used all over the place to teach basics of computer architecture. Um, a common simulator is called SPIM. It's primarily used in embedded systems, TiVo, Cisco routers, and a lot of game, uh, game consoles. PlayStation, PlayStation 2, PlayStation Portable, N64, you know. So it's a, it's a fairly uh, commonly used architecture. And um, for, for one of the courses at uh, University of Delaware, we actually designed and coded in VHDL a 32-bit MIPS multi-cycle CPU um, using a finite state machine controller, five-stage data path. Um, we didn't program the full ISA, but about six instructions. If you want to add more, obviously, it's just a matter of coding more. Um, test benches are a big thing in GHDL. Because you don't use a F an FPGA, in order to see if your uh, code works, you need to write a test bench for it, give it inputs, and try and program, um, see if it gives you the right outputs. So it will basically, a test bench will create an instance of the code you want to test, create a running clock, and then run it against uh, input and assert correct output. And hopefully, what you assert is right. So GHDL, like I said, is a command line program. There are a bunch of flags up there. You don't need to memorize them because there's the manual page for it. Um, but you know you have to analyze your code, you have to create your executable of your test bench, you have to run your executable. That last little function down there is for a program called GTK Wave, which we'll talk about, uh, Steve's going to talk about later. Um, so this is you know, the series that you have to run in order to run something. You compile, you analyze your, if you want to make a shift register, you write your shift register program, and then you write your test bench for it. Um, you analyze both of them, create your executable of your test bench, and run the test bench. And hopefully it doesn't say error, which more often than not it will say error, especially when you're just getting started. GTK Wave is very similar to the ISC Waveform Simulator, um, but again, it's open source, uses GTK, who to thunk. Um, it can view, you can view any of the signals in any of the code that you're running, and you can view it as binary, hex, integers, anything that's useful for you. For, for the vectors. Um, you can also see for signals, it just gives you a waveform. So we're going to give you a quick demonstration of a uh, MIPS microprocessor that we wrote, uh, multi-cycle 32-bit like we talked about earlier. Um, Steve's going to run through it and just show you some code and show you it running, hopefully, and then show you GTK Wave. All right, so a couple things. Now, I've heard some people, they've talked to me before, and they've said, well, I don't know VHDL, and that's really the you know, stopping block from getting me playing with that stuff. And I don't want to go out and spend the initial money to get the FPGA. 
I didn't either until I found this. It's very easy, and as you're going to see as we walk you through our little virtual machine, that it's, it's really not as hard as it may seem. So here we have our CPU that, as he said, was done by a team of three. We were undergrads. We had no knowledge about the processor and uh, how to make it, how to code VHDL. So let's see if we can zoom in. Control Alt. Can we make it bigger? Let's go full screen. Let's full screen it. Does that help at all? No. no, no, no. It's, it's exactly the same Great. size. Great. Yeah. Let's try this. Dip up. Let's see. And hopefully better. 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 I, I know it's not perfect. Um, we'll post this code up if you want. You want to do that? Sure, why not? We'll, we'll put the code up on the website, so if you want to pull it down later and take a look. I'll go over the basic flow. So basically, as uh, Basically, there's a bunch of VHDL files. Each time you make an entity, kind of like how you might make an object in coding, you'll make it its own VHDL file and you'll make it its own entity. So for instance, when we wanted to register, we would make the reg.vhdl file. Now you can make these things generic and all that fun stuff, all those details that are wonderfully documented online. But what we're going to look at right now is the part that brings it all together, the super CPU as we called it. Do we? All right. Disclaimer, I did not make this VM, so he can't yell at me. Emacs, VI, I know, I don't want to start the war, so. Emacs. Nano, Nano I know comes default on Gen 2, so when all else fails, I go drop down the Nano, you know, Pico for those who want to go even older. Um, so like they've gone over, you know, you've got your library, your includes, build the CPU, bring it all together. As you can see in here, we've got stuff like the ALU, all the stuff that we coded individually, right? But none of this really makes sense to us, at least from analyzing it, because all this is done is actually glued it together. Imagine you have a circuit, all this is done is connected the wires. So now what we have is, as Corey was pointing out, the test bench. Okay? Now the test bench has a certain format. I'll be honest, I never memorized it. We were given a test bench and I just kept editing it. So it, it makes sense eventually, but it's not something I've memorized. However, what you do is basically this. You've got a black box at this point. You've got all the connectors to the outside. What you do is you start hooking up inputs to them. For instance, here we might set the signal for the reset to one, the clock to one, and the done to zero. Right, so these are the initial states we'll set it to. Then after this, we start beginning a process. Let's see, it's a little bit down further. There it is, right here, where we actually start driving input into our black box, all right? And we start hoping that output comes out. If you were to want to actually test the functionality, let's look at the register. Where's Okay. What's got a test bench? Do we have any test benches? No. Oh, well, all right, sorry about that. Uh, we'll go back to this one. If you wanted to actually test the functionality of something, you can do things just like in C, you can assert the states and stuff like that and have it print out wonderfulness like this isn't right. Uh, usually you'll find out it's due to things like timing, so it gives a nice wonderful output telling you at what millisecond or what exact clock cycle it failed. And that's basically it. It's just like getting the output from a C compiler. You get a bunch of stuff and you got to hope you understand it. So what we have over here is what's known as GTK wave. Let's full screen this. All right, now GTK Wave takes a special output file that's uh, generated by GHDL. Think of it more as the sort of like it took snapshots along the way of what was happening at every instance, and it records that in a file. And then this allows you to visualize it. So here we have different inputs from our CPU actually inside it. Remember before I said the test bench can't test the internals, it'll test the externals. 
GTK Wave allows you to view the internals, view every signal inside of it. We were so excited when we found out we could see inside our CPU and didn't have to keep guessing based on it was just not working. So over here on the left, you'll get a wonderful list. Unless it crashes. We're going to ignore that. Uh, moving right along, it'll give you all your signals broken down from every component. For instance, the memory, you can look at the clock cycle that's going into the memory to find out is one point that we somehow inverted the clock going into our memory. Wasn't fun. Over here, you can then drag these signals that'll show up down here from the components over here and it'll give you in terms of the time unit. Uh, here we've got our clock going. We've got some data output. We've got different stuff. I think we had a component. Is this the super CPU? Yeah. Okay. So we've got some uh, operations occurring and as you can see here, you can see them in hex. We can blow this up and view them in binary. We could look at them in any type of format you want. So if you've got ASCII characters going through, you can look at that. Now, you'll notice here at the top you see PS for picoseconds. This is simulation. We called it the super CPU because we could set whatever time we wanted and our processor ran at it. So do not take this literally and translate it into hardware because it will fail. <laughs> As Rodney was pointing out, there's a stage in the actual ISE step that will show you where that simulation goes into reality and takes into those effects. Um, no matter. Sorry. No matter how much you want, you will not design a 500 gigahertz CPU with your FPGA. You can do it on this, though. It's fun. Although our processor was, you know, 2 gigahertz, somehow we were able to simulate 500 gigahertz. The beauty of simulation. Um, act, so within here, you'll see that we have 32 bit. Right here, it says 31 to 0. That means we have 32 bits wide, and we can decode all those lines. We can even expand them and look at the individual lines if we wanted to. You can look at any of the clock intervals and do wonderful things like that search, set markers, all the stuff you might do if you were doing, say, a GDB trace so through your source code. So you can think of it that way. Um, again, it's available across all the platforms. We've run it on OS X, we've run it on Linux, we've run it on Windows, so it's easy to get into. Not so much GHDL running on all those, but GTK Wave. And kind of a forewarning, there's two output that two outputs that you can create off GHDL. One will say that it's the GTK Wave format, one that says it's the Verilog format. Avoid the Verilog one. It's not fully compatible, and you'll only get to see some of your things. So uh, when you go back and look at the slides, Corey gave the proper argument for that. So that's it. And uh, I think that about wraps it up. So. so I'm going to, now that you guys sat through our lovely little discussion about that, I'm going to set this back to the right screen size, hopefully. Oh, that's nice. And yep, you guessed it. It's contest time again. So we're going to announce our winners. Um, again, we're giving away another FPGA board. We're giving away some bobbleheads and some t-shirts. So uh, we're going to do the same thing we did last time. And hopefully Bob or Chris or whoever shows up this time. OK, so we saw some pretty interesting answers this time. Some people thought that the code was a port scanner for some reason. Um, <laughs> I'd love to see someone implement that on FPGA. I'm sure it's been done. but. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was actually a MUX, and quite a few people got it right this time. So should be interesting uh, who gets the Spartan this time. So for the Spartan 3E. Uh, using true random numbers. Uh, <laughs> pseudo random. <laughs> I'm sorry, pseudo random. Mm. Okay. Michael Bringle. Hey, hey. All right. Congratulations. All right, and apparently we have some Intel bobbleheads. This should be good. Ooh. That's some nice swag. I have to run over with that. Mike Johnson. Oh, gave us. All right. Congratulations. Sure. All right. And the other bobblehead, uh, AGL. 
Agle. There it is. Congratulations. All right. Yeah, yeah, feeling lucky. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. For the T-shirt, Jesse. Is there a few Jessies? <laughs> All right. Let me check the password. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Sorry, other Jesse. <laughs> it's okay. Maybe I'll pick yours next. Okay, and for the last T-shirt, Kai of the Sky. I think I pronounced it right. Kai of the Sky? Yeah. Right. Oh, whoa, right here in the front. Oh. Uh-oh, he's oh. forgot the password. <laughs> Doesn't have the password. Well, does anybody else have Kai of the Sky in this room that would contest this, this winner? He... <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, don't, I don't see another one, so. Bagel, bagel monster. That's a strong one. All right, well, thank you. And we got two more contests coming up. So by now, I, I think you guys got the uh, general idea. This time we're going to give away another, yeah, another board and uh, some T-shirts. And uh, after this, we're but one contest away from giving away the netbook. So I hope people stay around for that. Um, the third question this time around, what is the largest on-chip memory? Actually, we haven't done we, that part yet. We haven't done this yet, apparently, so I don't know what we want to do. <laughs> we'll just do the talk and then... We'll do the talk and have the question after that, so if anyone just read that and they're starting to think, just... just no, Keep an no, ear out no, for no, like that. Yeah, no, no. Okay. Keep an eye, ear out. It has something to do with memory. So. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so I'm Dr. K. Actually, I, uh, I teach the, some of the VHDL courses at University of Delaware, and all the guys here have taken these courses. We have, uh, just to share with you, we have three courses in this. Uh, the first course, they come in and just learn the language, VHDL language, and run GHDL. Second course, they come in and they run a lot of Xilinx programs, build a small video game, do EDK stuff. The third course, we actually uh, build, they, they design and build their PCB, send it to FAB, it comes back, they solder on the FPGA, the DDR RAM, and, and then they actually build their own box. It could be a game, it could be a wireless LAN or something like that. So, so it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so I'm going to give you a background on EDK. Um, EDK is uh, very powerful stuff. It, it's kind of the next level. Um, you know, we're starting to see so complex systems now, you know, with all kinds of functions. And when you're building these things, you don't want to start from scratch, right? You want to sort of bring in a lot of components, a lot of, it's called IP, intellectual property on. And that's what the EDK allows you to do. So the embedded development kit is a piece of software uh, from Xilinx and uh, that enables you to develop embedded systems. It, uh, uh, it includes all the tools, documentation, and IP components that you need to, to build pretty reasonable systems. Um, and it enables you to integrate both hardware, which is your design, hardware design, with the software. And I'll show you how to do that. Now, uh, unfortunately, EDK is not free. It is $495 to buy, uh, and you can buy it from these two distributors. And there is a 30-day evaluation that you can get from Xilinx. And uh, there's also a link at the bottom for uh, uh, manuals and application notes if you're interested to learn more about EDK. All right, so this is going to be a little bit of repeat of what uh, Rodney did in the very beginning. So if, if you want to build an embedded system, something that has a fixed function, not a general purpose computer, you, you have a number of choices today. You can, you know, take a microcontroller, and the DEF CON badge is a good example, right? If you were here last year, the badge had a microcontroller, and now this year, the DEF CON badge has a DSP, so that's another way to do it. Um, if you have a, a, a very large volume, 
and you have a uh, very low cost target per unit, then you might actually consider building your own ASIC. You know, basically a custom integrated circuit costs a lot of money. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of upfront cost, but, but this is the way to get parts at 10 cents a part or something like that. And then the fourth way, which I'm going to be talking about here with you, is using FPGAs using the EDK. All right? And hopefully I can illustrate to you why you would want to consider an FPGA for an embedded system. So the steps that uh, you need to take when you're designing embedded systems in an FPGA are the following. You first develop your hardware design. Okay, your hardware design is, okay, am I going to use a CPU? What type of CPU I'm going to have? Is it going to have an instruction cache, data cache? Then am I going to use memory? Is it going to be DDR, RAM, SDR? Is it going to be flash? What IP components do I need? Do I need an Ethernet controller? Do I need a, a PCI interface? And once you've done with your hardware design, the next step would be to generate the drivers and libraries. So it's in essence, you've built a custom computer for yourself, and now whoever is going to write the software will need the library files and will need the include files, and, and you, need, you need to generate that. That's what we'll show you how to do. Once that's generated, you can actually hand this thing over to somebody who knows very little about FPGAs, is more, is more at an application software level, and they can develop the code uh, that implements your application. So what I'm showing here is a, is a typical embedded system. Uh, this is for the boards that we have right now, and what you can see there is that the, uh, at the heart of it all is a microblaze processor. It's a 32-bit processor, and then you, you would select, this is a soft processor, you would select it, you would configure it with the options you like, and it would be compiled and thrown onto the FPGA. And then with that processor, you would select whatever IP you need. So whatever your embedded system needs, you would pick the components that you need and add them to your design. And the MicroBlaze is one of two processors that Xilinx provides uh, for this particular uh, board that we're giving away today, that's the only option, uh, but their more powerful Vertex devices can do a PowerPC uh, type of processor. So the MicroBlaze is a 32-bit processor. It's soft configurable. There's lots of options. You can configure it to be a three-stage or a five-stage. You can have instruction data cache. You can have a floating point unit if you wish. You can also have uh, a virtual memory uh, uh, option. You have 32-bit general purpose registers, uh, 32 of them, and uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you have two different instruction types, and this shows you some assembly language code for that. Now, I said that one of the keys to embedded system development is these IP cores, because you've got to get your system built really fast, and there, it's got to follow all these standards, and the fastest way to do it is rather than writing your own code, pull in these components that are pre-made. And so Xilinx has, uh, has created a wide variety of IP cores, and you will see in the demo, you can just pull them and drop them into your design. Uh, you can also go to opensource.org and, and get the source code for these cores. The stuff you get from Xilinx, uh, about half of it is free, and you can use it on a royalty-free basis. And I believe the other half is, is actually either from Xilinx or from other vendors, third-party vendors. You can try it. If you like it, uh, I've never gone to that level, but I believe you, you'll have to pay royalties for, for usage. Now, one thing I want to say is this whole design is based on memory mapped I.O. In other words, when you write code for your microprocessor, uh, the memory space, the 32-bit address space, is basically going to be partitioned. And you're going to have, you know, your main memory is going to be in there, and then your peripherals will actually be mapped into the address space. Okay, so when you read and write in your code to the memory locations, you might be actually writing to RAM or you might be talking to your peripherals. You may be, you know, sending stuff over the Ethernet controller. And the thing I want to make you aware of is that there's different latencies and penalties. You know, from the code point of view, it's the same uh, C or assembly language instruction that does the write, but if you're writing to a, a DDR RAM, your latency might be five clock cycles. But I know that if you're writing to uh, a UART or a USB device that is sitting on a, on a bus, then the latency is going to be at least 50 clock cycles. And if the bus is busy with other transactions, it might take longer. So 
you, you, might, uh, you might wonder, well, why should I use FPGAs to build embedded, develop, uh, embedded systems, right? So the main thing, in my opinion, is, um, is that uh, it allows you to trade off between hardware and software, right? I mean, let's say you write some function on a CPU, and you run it, and you find it's not fast enough, right? It's not fast enough for your application. So then what you have is you have this, this uh, thing called fast simplex links, and fast simplex links is, is basically if you have something, it doesn't work fast enough, you go off to the side and you write a, a piece of VHDL code uh, using what Ryan just showed you, VHDL, uh, ISC, and that accelerates that by 1,000, maybe 100,000 times. And then you use a fast simplex link to actually put it inside the, inside the processor pipeline, uh, and so the, then you basically uh, execute you, you can dispatch work for your custom functions from the processor and the latency penalty is only a few clock cycles, okay? So you can literally trade off uh, hardware and software and you can sort of move that s uh, boundary and that's what the power of EDK is and those functions are actually implemented in hardware, the ones that you want to accelerate. And you can have multiple accelerators in your design. Uh, the uh, FSL bus is implemented using uh, a FIFO. So you basically write in, in, inside of your processor, you, as soon as you get instructions to the FSL, they go into a FIFO and they come out on the FIFO on the other end. So if your accelerator is, has a latency of one clock cycle, you will get that result on the next clock cycle. It's really fast. So for example, for our project where the students build a video game, that they design their own graphics card, right? They, they design their graphics accelerator that drives the VGA. That graphic accelerator runs on the FSL bus. And you can imagine if you did it on a PLB bus where you have 50 clock cycle latency, the video game would be very stuttery. So now I wanna talk about the tools. So there are actually three tools uh, that are in the play when you do embedded development. Uh, the tool over here is basically what Ryan showed you. That's the standard uh, ISC stuff. What we have on the left here is basically an SDK. It's a software development environment. You're just writing C code. And in the middle here is the embedded uh, design system. So how does it work? Well, you start out here. You're the computer architect and you say, what do I need? I'm going to need two processors. I'm going to need an I.O. controller, an Ethernet port, Wi-Fi controller. So you specify that, what you want, and then that creates a system netlist, and then that netlist is actually hundreds of thousands of lines of VHDL code. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, it's just a lot of code. Then that's dropped into ISC, and ISC runs compile. So compile of hardware for EDK can take a very long time because you, you are compiling a large, large pieces of code. Then that produces the, the bit file, Okay, and you can actually take that bit file and you can download it on an FPGA and many students do that and then they find out that it does nothing. Why, why is that? The software is not there, right? So the, the, when, when you throw that onto the FPGA, your processor is probably executing a no-op loop and it's just gonna sit there doing nothing. So what we need is we have our embedded system, it's ready to go, but we haven't written the software. So the next step you do is you create a board support package. This is done for you automatically. And this is a bunch of libraries, uh, header files that the software needs so you can write your C code for your hardware, okay? Then you go into this SDK environment, which is basically has nothing to do with FPGAs and you write your code, all right? And that produces uh, link files. And the final step is this application called data to mem which takes your hardware image takes your software image, brings them together into one unified bit file, and then that gets downloaded onto the FPGA and then you're up and running. Okay, then you download that and you've got your iPod or a video game or whatever it is that you're building. So to summarize, the flow uh, consists of these steps. First, you develop the hardware, decide what pieces you want. Next step is to develop the embedded software, okay, and then you operate it in hardware. Okay. Yes. You could do it that way, or you could have it hard coded right into the CPU. Um, you can actually have a file system where you load 
programs. Uh, then you start to get an operating system land. So, you very. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Well, can you repeat the question, please? So you're writing code to this microplace board. You know, where, where inside of the FPGA does it go? Does it take off microcells? Okay. Let, let me re repeat for the rest of the audience your question. The question is, you're writing code. Where does that code go? Okay. The, there are lots of options. The FPGA itself has an onboard memory. As you will see, the device we have on this board has 32 kilobytes of onboard memory. It's incredibly fast because it's on board. Now, uh, so you can put your program there, but if your program is pretty big, on our particular board, we have a 64 megabyte DDR RAM chip, so you can have it loaded there. We also have parallel flash. You can put your program there. We have serial flash. You can put your program there. The FPGA supports many different options. When the students design their board in a class, they choose. You know, so they put some people put SD card and they put the code there. The EDK supports that, and and you specify where you want your code to go, and it kind of automatically manages all that, which is really nice. You know, all that memory mapped I/O, it's done for you. Yeah, and you'll see that in the demo. Other questions? That's actually one of the biggest things that the EDK does for you is hide that complexity and manage all that mapping. And from the C point of view, you're just writing to memory. Uh, the question is, if I was writing an embedded system that has a GUI, would I do the GUI on the software side or would I do the GUI on the VHDL or hardware side? Um, I, I think the answer to that, in my opinion, would be that if, if you want to do accelerated GUI functions like putting up windows, you could actually write some cool VHDL to really do that fast. And then on the software side, you would call those hardware functions. Uh, can somebody else answer? The question was, does VHDL support a GUI framework? You, in VHDL, I mean, you're writing in hardware, so you, you're kind of creating your own, uh, your own driver, in a sense, for, for VGA or, or whatever you're outputting to. So, I mean, whatever functionality uh, you wanted to include, you write, you know? The, the other thing I would probably say about this, is, and also kind of an aside, I think the reason why this software still costs money is because it's fairly, well, it's been around for a while, but it just started to come into its own. And the Linux kernel actually, a couple major revisions ago, just added the MicroBlaze processor as one of its supported architectures. So a lot of these questions are kind of open because you can run Linux on the FPGA. So if you got Linux and you got your VGA controller, you don't need to write a GUI framework. Um, if you, you know, theoretically, could you write your own? I think that you're quickly, if you, you, I think where this is going is there's going to be a lot of Linux and there's going to be a lot of reusing of code because you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You don't want to code an entire operating system. The idea is that you can do the hardware parts that you want to do that are very specific to your application and then reuse a bunch of code it's already been written by other people. That's good code. Um, so I, I think that we haven't done GUI programs yet on ours. Um, we're kind of in the uh, Commodore 64 era, if you will, with our development of this stuff. But I think that it's quickly ex uh, gonna it's gonna vary over the next couple of years on the complexity of this. Okay, so let's do a demo. So here here's my board. It's all hooked up to uh, the PC. I've got the power cable. I have a, a serial port that I'm going to, one of the peripherals I'm going to show you that I'm going to instantiate is a serial port. So that's my serial port cable here. The other peripheral I'm using, uh, there's a USB port here, and it's used for programming the FPGA. That's how we send the bit file. And I'll show you also, we'll, we'll run a hardware debugger and actually step through the processor step by step through instructions. And uh, the debugging is done over the USB port. So I'm going to set that down and uh, launch the SDK for you, uh, the EDK, so. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I'll try to increase the font size. So uh, the EDK, I'm going to use a, uh, 
uh, a wizard, you know, to sort of speed things up. Um, and I'm uh, going to give it a directory. Is it? It is really small, huh? Can I see it on back? Oh, hold on. Yeah, we'll change that. It, uh, it really, ah, that's annoying. Here we go. Yes, okay. How about now? All right, so uh, I'm going to create a new design for this particular board. So uh, I'm going to crea say create a new design and this board is uh, made by Xilinx and they make a number of different boards. I know that this is this board and I know that it's revision D so I'm going to select that. All right, so the wizard actually knows that this board is, is uh, got this FPGA Spartan 3 and it knows all the various parts on it so now it's basically offering me to configure uh, peripherals on this board uh, for my design. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to configure a processor. I'm going to use the microblaze and uh, I can choose a different speed. I'm going to run it at 50 megahertz. As I said, uh, in order to have real-time debugging capability as we write software, we need to include the on-chip hardware debug module. And I said earlier that the maximum on-chip memory we can use is 32 kilobytes. I'm just going to go with 16 here. And if our program is larger than that, you'll see there's an option later to use other memory. Uh, we're not going to use a cache, we're not going to use a floating point unit, and in fact, Microblaze has uh, about two dozen other options that you can drill down later on. Uh, the wizard is kind of for simple use, you know, it doesn't expose all those. Uh, we're not, this is the peripherals, you know, basically what peripherals on your board do you want to use in your embedded design? I'm just going to use one peripheral and that is the RS-232 port. That's the cable I showed you. And so I'm going to uncheck, you know, the LEDs. I'm not going to use them, buttons. And when I uncheck that, that means there's actually not going to be hardware generated on the FPGA to interface with those components. All right? So you can see that DDRS DRAM, I'm not going to use that. And that will actually save a lot of FPGA area. On the other hand, if your program is very large, you would want that probably. Uh, there is an Ethernet interface. Uh, I'm not going to use it, so I'm going to uncheck that. All right? So at this point, uh, I have my, uh, I'm sort of at the end of this, and what it's telling me here is that my standard I.O. will go to the RS-232 port, and so to see it, we'll actually run TerraTerm and see it in the TerraTerm window. And then uh, my boot memory, that was a question earlier, where is your code coming, uh, executing from the FPGA? That's basically where you say, okay, my code will run from uh, ILMB controller, which is the local memory on the FPGA. Uh, here I'm going to pick an application. It's actually going to make me an application, self-test application. So it's going to have, okay, and this, this screen here is uh, telling me where do you want your instructions, data, stack, and heap. So again, you can put all these in different types of memories in your device. Okay, here's your memory map. You have uh, uh, the UART. This is your serial port. This is the base address for the serial port. This is the hardware debugger and it has a different ser uh, base address. Here's your local memory, all 32 kilobytes of local memory. This, by the way, is your, uh, 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 one of them is your instruction uh, memory and the other one is your data. And they basically share the same space. And now I hit generate and when I, once I hit generate, uh, it'll come back and, uh, and here's my architecture basically. So uh, let's look at this. This is kind of my uh, uh, you know, main screen into the EDK. What you see here, uh, I can draw a block diagram, and you'll see this, this is my design. It kind of looks like an iPod. Uh, but this is my processor, and uh, uh, this is my memory, and uh, so this is one view, this is kind of a graphical view. I can also go here, and I can see the system view. So you can see, it's probably small font, but these, all of these things are your components. And remember I told you about the IP components. If I click here on the IP catalog, you can see it's, again, I apologize for the small font, but there's lots of different components. So you can, uh, you can go here and look at PCI. Here's a PCI arbiter. And if I want to include that in my design, all I have to do is drag it here and drop it into my hardware design, and it appears. Now, 
I don't think I want to do that in my case right now, so I'm going to delete it. Yeah, 495 you get uh, yeah, you get everything. And if I if I click here on some of these things, uh, where is that? You will see that the the ones that have a green star are are free and you can use them to your heart's content. But there is some paid stuff somewhere here. Okay. Okay. So you can see like this, right? With a with a dollar sign and a lock. You can use that, uh but I think if you start selling it, uh you need to pay. All right. So, um let's move on here. So, you, you've built your hardware, right? This, these are the components. You can add components. You can go into your processor. You can right click and you can configure your processor. You know, so as I said, there are tons of options for a microblaze. You have a barrel shifter, you, you know, just configure whatever you like. Um, you can, once you're happy with this, you can change your address space. What you would do is you'd go to the hardware and you would generate netlist Okay, and what that would do is it would go and grab the VHDL or Verilog for all these different components. And stuff that you pay for probably is gonna be encrypted Verilog or VHDL because they typically don't wanna show the source code. And, and it's gonna create this one net list which is, I don't know, 100,000 lines. And it's gonna run a compile. And so it's a very long compile. You can see this arrow here spinning. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna interrupt this process and I'm going to load something that the same thing that's already been compiled so we can just move on quickly. So here is a design and it's the same design but except that I've already compiled it. All right. So it's been compiled and what I normally would do after generating the netlist I would generate the bitstream. Okay. And again nothing to do because it's already been done. Now if I I can send that to this board and nothing would happen because my software isn't done yet. My software is under here, under the Applications tab. I have a default project, and, and here is my source code here. Oops. So here's my source code. All right. Okay, so what I would do is I'd go under Software, and I would generate all, uh, uh, build all user applications. All right, and again, that's already been compiled, so it's telling me that you know everything is cool. The remember this thing I mentioned that you combine your software image with your hardware image. That's the update bitstream part. And then once that's done, uh, you download the bitstream onto the FPGA. And as it's downloading, I'm going to quickly switch to this TerraTerm window, and what we'll hopefully see is actually our uh, program. So there it is. It, uh, if I reset the board. It just brings this message, and that's basically this test application. And just to show you that it is really our test application, let's go in there and let's uh, do something like uh, print hello world. So let's, uh, it's okay for them. All right, so let's just go like this, and we'll say, Hello world. All right, we're going to save that and we're going to generate the application. Okay, and then we're going to update the bitstream. And then we're going to download the bitstream and I'm going to go back to this. Okay, and you should see a bunch of hello worlds come up. Yeah, maybe reset it. Oh, oh, it, it's there. There it is. Right? It Try it. Oh, it didn't. Okay. Mm. What? Oh, okay. Did you save it? Yeah, maybe. No, I did. But one thing you want to notice is that when you change the software, it doesn't have to recompile all the hardware. So if you need to change one line, the hardware is the part that takes like 30 minutes to compile depending on the complexity. And so if you change a couple lines in the C, uh, it doesn't, doesn't only takes as long as it does to compile however long your complicated your C is, which usually isn't that complicated. 
Is it still misbehaving? Okay. Oh, it's not. Okay. Well, we'll we'll move on. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what I want to show you next is basically you don't you don't have to program your C from this platform. What you can do is uh, you can launch a software uh, development kit, which is SDK, and at that point uh, you can hand this design over to somebody who is just doing C programming. And at at the SDK level, they'll just be writing C programs uh, that will run on the FPGA. And hopefully we'll get that hello world working there. All right. So we're going to create a new application project here. And I'm going to say test program. All right, and let's try the hello world again here. Print hello world. Okay, and when I save it, it, it should automatically uh, generate a link, uh, link file. And, and now I'm going to run it on the device. All right, so I'm going to run the debugger. Remember when we configured the hardware, we made a hardware debugger. So we're actually going to step through the hard step through this program and see on the hardware. So I'm going to debug on hardware. And if you notice, there was actually an option to debug it on the simulator. So if you don't have the board, you can actually run an instruction simulator in software to do this. So this is my program. Let me, let me bring the Terra term here. And let's, uh, let's clear the screen. Yeah. Clear the buffer. And then this, this, this little icon here is to run the program. So if I hit it here and I go back to the Terra term, there's my hello world, okay? So this is an SDK. It's probably something familiar to you if you write a lot of C++ or C code. And, and you can basically write your software on for the embedded system from the SDK. So that concludes this part of the talk. Contest time. Okay, now we're gonna do this contest. I promise. So are we doing contest three and four in parallel? No. Okay. I don't even wanna think about that. I'm not a parallel programmer. I haven't taken that course yet, so I don't even wanna think that way. Um, so yeah, we're gonna do the, that, that's not even running. Okay, that's not even helpful. So like I said before, we're going to give away another Spartan board and some more t-shirts. So the question, if you were paying attention last time, what is the largest on-chip memory size that can be used on the Spartan 3 e-board? So same rules apply as before. Um, answer questions and we'll get back. We're actually going to... Uh, have Furkan demonstrate his Linux on FPGA, and right after that, before we do the Altera demo, we'll have our netbook question up. So, best of luck to everyone on that. Uh, anybody have any questions? And if anyone has any questions for Dr. K about uh, any of the EDK stuff you just saw, feel free to stand up, shout it out. Sure. So, open core is free. I can run Webpack under Linux on small devices, and that's free. Yeah. Do I have to have EDK to use microblades or any core I get off of open core? Um, What's the hard way to do it to save the hardware? Is there a hard way? So, the question, the question was that I, open cores is free and uh, I can imply from that, I can jump from that, that you can probably get a processor source, source code for a processor. And you can roll your own EDK, uh, so save $500. Uh, yeah, that, the answer is yes, you can save uh, money and roll your own. What the EDK does is it integrates all these things together and it gives you all these IP peripherals. They all plug in, uh, the bus is compatible, so it, it's, it's a convenience. Actually, going along with what uh, Dr. K just said, in uh, preparing for this presentation, 
I went online and actually found the VHDL source code for an HC11 Motorola microprocessor online for free. So uh, you don't really have to look that hard in order to find these things. Apparently Nintendo's online too. If, if you want to FPGA Nintendo. NES, Steve? Yeah, NES, there you go. Who doesn't want an NES on an FPGA? That's what I thought. By the way, the answer to this contest question was in the talk twice. Do, does anyone else need the question up there? Otherwise, we're going to switch over to another. OK, I hear no shouts. Oh, you're actually on here. Okay. Oh. I was gonna bring stage down. Yeah. Talk about Linux and then stop, and I'll do the contest, and then you can do. Okay. Sound good? Yeah. Yeah, it is the same board, yep. Um, we we talk about this game demo that everybody like talk about like game 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 and you were wondering like uh, what this might be. It's up on the screen. It's just running on this um, small board here. It's basically like I don't know have you ever played Roadrunner? I believe it was the name. 
just uh, like cars coming down and then the red car is yours and then you're just trying to escape from the cars, you know, like basically it's this stuff here. Yeah, so, you know, you're trying to escape the cars and uh, after some time it's going to get like the speed is going to increase. So, like, you know, and then <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you can do this kind of stuff. Like you know, with an FPGA using a VGA cable, basically, what it does is like um, just uh, you write the VG, like the VGA code uh, in VSTL, and then you pass uh, you pass some arguments from C code. You um, like keep track of the speed and um, uh, the button movements and stuff in C, and then you pa pass the code to uh, V. VHDL, and then you know you have a pretty nice game over there. So there's a problem here. Can you restart my machine? Can you try this by this again? I tried. This one. Oh, I'm trying. So. Yeah. Uh, hi everybody, again. My name is Furkan. Uh, I'm one of the CWORK members here. I'm a graduate student uh, at the University of Delaware. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, Linux on Spartan 3. So, first of all, what we need to run Linux on this uh, board, uh, of course, we need an uh, FPGA board. In this case, we use um, Xilinx Spartan 3 500. And the software is a Xilinx IC EDK. You can download from xilinx.com. And um, for Linux that we run, uh, there are some, others, uh, some Linux distributions that you can use. Uh, one of them is like Petal Linux, uh, which is the, uh, one of the good ones. And then uh, it's free also and mostly it's like GPL. So uh, there are some other solutions like Blue Cat um, or like Monta Vista maybe. So you can download the Peta Linux from petalogics.com. Uh, the version 0.4 is out, I think, uh, the latest version. And for the, um, like the machine, you just, uh, you can run it on, on Linux as uh, someone asked is uh, IAC and EDK, can we run it on Linux? Yeah, uh, we can, you can install it on Linux and then you can run it. So in this particular case, I use Arch Linux and Pardos. Um, so what are the steps to um, just, you know, keep you up uh, dated? So the step one is like to prepare the work workaround. Uh, first of all, we would need to install Xilinx IAC EDK software and then, um, install the Xilinx USB cable. Uh, installing the Xilinx USB cable is, uh, in Linux is a little bit uh, like hard. You need to do some uh, hacks maybe uh, on, the, on like Windows version. Uh, Xilinx gives support, like official support to Red Hat Enterprise, I think. Uh, I mean, if you are using like CentOS and Red Hat Enterprise, maybe you would be fine, but if you are using another uh, like distribution, you would need to do some like hacks about USB thing. So you can, well, it just, it just doesn't seem right, but okay. You can s find some information on my blog uh, over there. You can see the slides on uh, from our website. And also uh, to, inst to download the image to the board, you would need a TFTP server up and running. This is not a necessary step, but um, it's a lot uh, faster than downloading in on a serial line. So, uh, I mean, you can use like NFS share or um, stuff. And also you would need a, a terminal to see this stuff, uh, which in Linux you have, I think, Kermit and Minicom solutions. For that, you can go ahead and download them. Also, the baud, uh, the baud rate uh, for this uh, particular Petal Linux 
uh, the good thing about Petolinux is uh, they they do all the stuff for you. I mean, they arrange all the cross comp compiles and other stuff, and then they build uh, like they, they pre, pre build all the stuff. Like as you uh, saw from uh, Dark K's presentation, like the peripherals, like choosing the peripherals, they do all that stuff for you, so you don't need to worry about like choosing peripherals and other stuff. So they define the uh, like fixed baud rate to uh, as like 11, 5200. Yeah. So the second step is to prepare the software. Uh, after like downloading the code, uh, extract it to your home directory, and then um, open up a terminal, and then go to your home directory, change directory to Petal Linux. Um, Z version 04, I believe the latest one is uh, RC4. And then after that, there is a settings file inside this uh, directory. Uh, you need to source it in order to uh, like run the commands uh, inside the program. There are just two versions of it. One is for bash and the other is for C shell. So if you are using like Z, Z, Z shell or uh, another shell, whatever, uh, you need to change to bash. I mean, it's good to change to bash. So let's see some demos. Hopefully, I'll not have. Having VGA issues. Yeah. It just worked before they yeah. did the presentation. Yeah. He's going to do the NASMA every time. Hmm? He's going to do the NASMA every five to get Yeah, okay. Well, while we're trying to figure out these problems, we're actually going to uh, give out the next set of prizes. So um, I'm pretty sure a lot of people got this one right. Um, as Dr. K did say it at least two times, um, the answer is 32 kilobytes is the maximum amount of memory. So uh, Steve's going to draw some names. All right, just to clarify, kilobytes, not kilobits. And uh, capital, B. capital B. So uh, and uh, real quick, I was alerted that to the fact that the uh, real Leroy Jenkins is in the audience. <laughs> so I wanted to just say hi to him and, you know, wave it out. But now we're going to do the drawing. <laughs> All right, and you want to give us help, Nadia? <laughs> All right, Corey Johnson. All right. Tara Z. All right, round of applause. Mikey.
All right, and uh, while we're waiting for Corey to come up and give us the last question, the Chuck up here, just want to ask everyone to please give a round of applause to Dr. Kiamlev up here. Not only did he get funding to bring us all out here and everything, he got you all the prizes that we're giving away today. So let's give him a round of applause. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Actually, the students made me do it. <laughs> but still, we can thank him. All right, and uh, Corey's going to come up and give us the uh, question, and we're going to try to do that. Okay, guys, this is, the, this is the question I know you've been waiting for, and you've been patient. I know three hours is a long time, so how about a round of applause for yourselves? Just because I've sat through lectures, and I know how it can be, so... so. PowerPoint. Okay, so like I said, this is the one we've been waiting for. We're going to give away the Acer Inspire Notebook or Netbook, six tumblers and a couple t-shirts. I know the other ones don't really seem all that thrilling, but trust me, they are. They are. So um, we're going to give you probably about 10 minutes-ish to figure this one out. This is obviously a little trickier, and you know, however you want to try and figure it out, you can try and figure it out. So. The question is, not being shamelessly plugging or anything, how many 128-bit registers are in each core of the Intel Core i7 processor? So again, if you need some slips, I, we might be running low, so if you have just scrap paper, you know, raise your hand and good luck. Does anyone need the question still up there? Okay. Of course, if anyone wants to try and bribe the contest manager. We'll verbally repeat it. We're going to try to get this VGA thing working. So once again, the question is, how many 128-bit registers are in each core of the Intel Core i7 processor? And this is either for a netbook or a lovely tumbler. I've been told to inform you that the netbook comes with a beautiful Intel carrying case. So, sweeten the deal a little bit. It's, it's like, like a, a it's like a mug kind of, but without a handle. And major props to anyone who chanced going on the DEF CON network to get this answer. <laughs> Hopefully the netbook will help, you know, reimburse you for getting whatever computer you use completely owned. Another, to, to repeat the question again, it's how many 128-bit registers are in each core of the Intel Core i7 processor? So 
so we'll let you keep working on this. Um, and I believe Furcon has a demo for you. So uh, if you'll direct your attention up front, we have uh, Linux on an FPGA. Uh, sorry about that. There was like VGA problems, and hopefully it's like solved. Now um, let's let's see a demo. Can the font be seen back from the back? Is it okay, the font? Yeah, I think so. So this is. Uh, let's go to. So this is the code that we downloaded from Peta Logics. Um, as you can see, there are like um, three different stacks, hardware, software, and tool. Uh, the hardware part is for, um, is for the EDK part that you have seen from Dr. K's pro presentation. The software side uh, is the Linux side where you can go ahead and compile the kernel. And um, so I'm using a Z shell, so I'm going to change it to bash. And um, source settings.sh. Now uh, I have all the Peta Linux uh, like executables over there in my uh, path. So now um, I'll go to software. And then compile the kernel thing. So in vendor products settings, um, there are two options here. Like there is one with Peta, Peta uh, logics on it, and the second one is like Xilinx. The Peta, Peta logic is basically like the um, some PowerPC or microblaze that you can uh, do by yourself. And we are gonna do the demo. We are gonna do the demo for our Spartan Free 500. So we have a lot of kind, different kinds of uh, Spartan boards or um, ML401 board here. Um, we are gonna choose the EDIC Xilinx Spartan uh, 3 500. And then uh, in kernel settings, we have two different stacks. One is 2.4, uh, the old stack, and the 2.6, the uh, new stack. And uh, we are going to come back here later to um, examine the custom customization settings. Now we are just going to create the um, first project. So uh, after we do that, we are going to go to hardware side, and then as you can see in reference designs, designs uh, Peta Linux uh, made all these uh, cool designs for us. Can't be seen over there. So there is our bo there is our platform here. Revision the light EDK, and um, so we are gonna start a new uh, EDK project. EDK uh, from Linux, if you want to run from command line, it's XPS. And uh, we are going to do that, but we are not going to use a GUI. So it's uh, no window with, with a no window option. And then um, our project is system.xmp. So we are now in uh, XPS shell. So we are not going to do anything here because all the things are done for us. We just save the uh, file and then start compiling it. So um, I compiled like um, like I think recently because it's going to take a, a, like t some time, as you can remember from. Um, Dr. K's presentation. So I pre-compiled it, so uh, it says like nothing to be done for bits. You first go ahead and compile the bits and uh, for the uh, bit files, and then you go ahead and compile the libraries. 
and also this is also pre-done. And then uh, you go ahead and program the FS boot. Um, in order to um, like run a code, there is a FS boot uh, which is I think uh, first stage boot. So you put that code inside the VRAM inside FPGA which uh, Dr. K told, told like um, so you put that code and then this is the first bootloader. And after this bootloader like boots up, uh, you, ran, you download the code to like a flash or other place, mi uh, micro boot. So uh, it boots the second bootloader, which you can go ahead and then uh, start your program, boot up uh, your kernel. So we are gonna make it to initiate in VRAM. And then, uh, so everything is done here. Basically these steps are gonna take like 10 minutes depending on your processor speed. And then, excuse me, no question. No. So um, now between the, Between the hardware and software projects, uh, Petalinux um, came up with a nice uh, script that you can run, and then after that, all the uh, settings that you are d you have done with this hardware side are going to be transferred to the software side, and then uh, be written in the configuration file, and then you can go ahead and compile your kernel depending on your on those thing, uh, settings. So uh, the command is like Petalinux copy autoconfig. So um, now it's doing that. Yep, we are done. Now the autoconfig file successfully updated. And then uh, we are basically done here. We are gonna go to um, our software side and compile our kernel. Now our vendor settings are the same. So there are like four different things here. Uh, default all settings, customize kernel settings, customize vendor user settings, update default vendor settings. Let's go ahead and customize kernel settings and vendor user settings. And hopefully most of you are familiar with this part of the um, thing, basic kernel comp uh, compilation. compilation. So uh, this is generally the uh, basic kernel comp compilation stuff like networking, um, Bluetooth device um, or SCIC device or whatever. I mean, you can choose what to compile, what, uh, and then like file systems. There are different file systems here. We are gonna ram. Uh, we are gonna choose our file system a, uh, is to be a, um, like ROM read only. So uh, I'm not gonna change any settings here. And then the second step here is about, uh, is uh, mostly the first step is already done I think because you, you don't need to worry about that step but the second step is important here uh, because you choose what program you wanna use on your FPGA. So the first system settings are like network address here. Uh, here you can define your Ethernet MAC address and then uh, you can choose to obtain IP address like uh, dynamic or you can choose to give a static IP address. And you define the server IP address also to communicate with your board. Um, basically after you download your code um, or basically after you download the micro, micro boot if you remember I said, I mentioned about TFTP server, you can get the ker uh, kernel image from TFTP use, uh, via these uh, IP addresses. So uh, just make sure that you know the IP addresses and you know you, you set them up co correctly. And default, default host name, uh, we are gonna choose our default host name to be like DEFCON demo. And default root passport, passport uh, is gonna be uh, DEFCON. So root file system types, there are 
different root file system types you can choose um, from there. Like copy file image to TFTP boot. Uh, if you are familiar with TFTP server, uh, there is a TFTP boot uh, folder that you can go ahead and pull up the files from there. So this is basically that directory. You define that directory to be um, whatever you want. And then the core applications here, you choose the core applications. Uh, what, like the uh, executables do you want to like um, run on your machine? So there are some cool stuff here, like libraries. Uh, which libraries you want to choose? And file stem applications, like mount, uh, unmount, um, or like some, if you want to run like Samba, you can choose it. Also, network applications. So you might not, you know, ever seen like in this screen, like where you pick what applications you want. And the reason why you would pick applications here is because these are actually applications that are going to be built into the image that's put on the FPGA. You could stick on an SD card, use a cross compiler, and compile whatever external applications you want. But these are ones that are going to be built in no matter what into the root boot file system. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, DHCP, uh, some Ethernet tools, HTTP server, FTP server, um, net, Netcat, and Nestat. Um, that should be somewhere. Yeah, Open SSL, Open VPN. Um, so you know, pretty much cool stuff here. SSH, uh, Telnet, TFTP. Uh, pro most of the stuff you can do. So other applications are like uh, mobile applications like Perl, Python. Um, you can write like codes and then compile it. Whatever. So and yeah, and three different games. <laughs> Dungeon. <laughs> if you ever played. I love this game. So yeah, basically we are done here. So we are just gonna go ahead and just uh, run the process here. Hopefully it's not gonna take some a lot of time. T it takes like four minutes for me. But I don't know. Yeah, we actually wanna also. We actually wanna start the TFTP server, right? Oh, we can go ahead there. Yeah. Okay, let's. No. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt it here. I think it's gonna take some time. Let's go ahead and pre-build here. So after you, um, okay, after you uh, compile the kernel, you'll get some files, some uh, files to you in inside your TFTP boot directory. Uh, some are some are like uh, kernel images in different formats and uh, some are like microboot things that you want to um, download. Uh, there are some, for example, there is one uboot s -rack here and then uboot dash s s -rack here. Dash s uh, is basically if you want to like, um, this is generally if you close the, uh, if you t power off the, uh, your board, your code is going to go away and you're not going to be able to run it again if you power on. So uh, what you want it, you wanna, if you, if you wanna run it uh, like initially, you can download the, you can uh, download the microboot dash s and then, um, you know, uh, you can run it initially, initially. So we are gonna go ahead and into,
into serial port before that we should start our terminal here yeah so this is the serial port on our FPGA on the button and on top I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna uh, dump the code inside the uh, serial port and you're gonna see hopefully ah before that we should If you remember, there was like server IP address and um, client IP address. Oh, yeah. Sorry, there was one more step. I forgot. We we um, generated the code code. Yeah. Now, um, if you remember, we um, generate the libraries, the bit files, and the program, but we didn't dump it to our FPGA. So we are gonna go ahead and then um, download it to our FPGA. Oh, there you go. So. As you can see here, the first stage bootloader has started. We dump the code inside the FPGA's VRAM, and then it's waiting for a SREC image to uh, be downloaded. So now we are good to, yeah, we are good to download our microboot. So as you can see, a spinning, like a dash over there, it's downloading code over serial line. And what we are gonna see is um, microboot uh, loading up. Well, comparing the size of the kernel and microboot, it's gonna. If you if you were to download the kernel, it's gonna it was gonna take like a lot of time. So it's pretty much. So it's like three three hundred K versus two and two, two and a half Mac. So we are in a uh, prompt of uh, microboot are here. We can this we can we have some co some um, commands that we can run. So uh, there are some different kinds of options here that we can use. So um, we have the TFTP server running. Yeah, we have the TFTP server running. So let's go ahead and um, download our image. As you, as we, yeah, as you can see here, I don't know if I, if you can read over there, but yeah, there there is a register um, over there, register address over there, like uh, that you can, like microboot starts, malloc starts, board info start. And there is a number over there. So what we want to do is we want to like a little bit pass that number and then write our uh, image over that number. So it's 8D, so we want to use like 8E. So TFTP um, and 8E. This is not E. Yeah. And then our image is image that you be. Yeah, it's loading the image. What we do, what we did is we are just we just downloaded our kernel image that we compiled. It's now on our FPGA. We just wrote it, and now we are gonna go ahead and execute that. So in order to do, let's first of all check. Yeah, that's correct. So we are gonna go ahead and execute it with boot m um, eight e. Zero, 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 zero. Ah, sorry. There you go. Now we are loading up our Linux kernel. 
at least. At last, yeah. There we go. We see the Def Gundam our login over there. We go ahead. Enter the password on. What was the password? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Here. We are now inside our FPGA box here. So, you know, if we do a processor just to make sure CPU family microblaze FPGA are Spartan 3E and then CPU version like 7.10 C so yeah I hope no. we can also turn that into it Yeah, there, as you can see, uh, it's running a like telnet server, so you know you can turn it into it or whatnot. All right, so um, give for kind of round of a hand for doing this Linux stuff. I mean, that, that's a real advantage of Linux is that it can run on pretty much any architecture, as you can see. The real question on all of our mind is, why would you want it to? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't wanting to run all this stuff. <laughs> all right, so, yeah. I guess we're uh, ready for the netbook then. Oh, one more thing, I guess. One more thing, we promise. Uh, Just so we're not totally uh, Xilinx. Yeah. Uh, Idiots here. You can see that uh, Altera has some software too. So the only, um, yeah, if you can see, there's a cool board here. Uh, it's an Altera board. Altera is, by the way, the second, the uh, other company, other FPGA company on the uh, market. Um, so they yeah. have different kinds of like boards, and this one is um, Cylon Two. Yep. I know the pronunciation. So. Uh, it has a cool touch screen over there. It's, it's running. We want to take a picture. So, yeah, it's uh, it has a touch screen over here, and then a five megapixel uh, camera here. Where, um, it, it has a lot of uh, like switches and LEDs over here, uh, like four buttons, and back on the board there's an SD card. Over uh, on the top there there is like um, microphone in and line out for speakers and uh, there is also a VGA port uh, on this FPGA it's pretty cool and there's also an LCD screen here you can like put up some cool stuff on that and yeah uh, let me show you a cool demo about this board so uh, the camera, camera on. Okay, do you already have it loaded? yeah, yeah or wait okay let me first pull up here so uh, this Quarter software is Altera's ISC. Uh, you can download it. Um, and there is one. There, there is this Nios software. It's for um, embedded um, applications. Also, you can download. It has Linux version, but it's pretty expensive. Write them nasty letters so they make it free, like the Windows version. Yeah, that's why I'm running it on a VM uh, over a crappy XP. So, um, I will pull up the demo for this board. So, 
I didn't, uh, I didn't have so much time to like examine all the stuff on that. So this is the demo from the Altera. Thanks to uh, Brian to um, support for his support. So uh, here, as you can see, the interface is pretty much the same as I see. You uh, you can see the um, the files over here. I don't know if you can see it from back, but yeah. So yeah, the compilation process is here, and the uh, messages are on the button. So we are gonna go ahead and start compilation. It's already again pre-compiled, so full comp compilation was successful. We are gonna uh, go ahead and swap the programmer. It's like impact in uh, Xilinx. Yeah, I will. Uh, let me show something. Yeah. So it's downloading the code. Um, yeah. So I will. Going to give you guys the camera. Basically, the um, software demo on here actually does um, edge detection. So it takes the picture that it takes in via the camera and can actually detect, you know, like shapes that are different colors, different brightnesses, and, and different things like that. So after we show this demo, we'll announce the netbook winner. So um, this is touch screen. When I touch the screen, it changes to normal mode. You know, as you can see. And again, it changes like it swaps the colors. So. Yeah. So basically, that's it. All right. Thanks, Furkan. If you have any questions, let me know. No. <laughs> so this is this is, I guess, what. Well, everyone who chose to wait, this is what you've all been waiting for. Um, and once again, I'd like to thank everyone for sticking around and hearing our talk. I uh, hope you learned something cool about FPGAs. And uh, you know, once we're done, feel free to ask questions. And if you see us throughout the rest of the con, ask us questions. And uh, we'll be happy to try and answer them. So uh, Steve and Mike here are going to uh, pull some names to see who wins. OK. We're, we'll, we'll do the answers as we like go over the questions. Um, but before before we give the answer to this, I just want to ask: Is uh, Rodney De Caratoret? Rodney De Caratoret is he here? Okay, I just want to return his business card, and I, I wouldn't want you know him to lose it knowing that um, it says US Stratcom on it and uh, Rodney De Caratoret at jtfgno.mil. So if anybody wanted to email him <laughs> and let him know how you feel about him leaving his US Stratcom business card around, you can. I'm gonna just. Leave it right there. We had to check the rules. We found out we can't apply that for Spot the Fed, so yeah. yeah. It was worth a shot. Sorry, Rodney. So for the question, uh, how many 128-bit registers are in each core of the Intel Core i7 NeoHAM processor? Uh, it was 16. 16. So everybody got that right. Good job. Yeah. When they first did the 128 registers, they did 8, and then they doubled it. Not in the i7, but in ones before it. But the i7 has 16 too. <laughs> what kind of name? <laughs> John. <laughs> How many Johns we got? One. Oh, just one. Okay, good. Yeah. Do we have a Spartan? I thought. Oh. <laughs> that was for the T-shirt. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. We gotta save the best for last. Sorry, we forgot to announce we're drawing 
We're drawing the netbook last. And for those of you who uh, didn't get called, I'm just happy though, right? Everybody have a chance. All right, all right, we'll play it fair. We'll play it fair. All right. We're gonna go backwards. We're gonna go backwards. All right. So we should, we should put him his name back. Yeah, we'll we'll chuck it back in there. All right. Fair, legit. Here's your entry. Okay. Going back in there, let's give it a... That was my fault. I'm sorry. I didn't remember to announce it. So, for another shirt... Well, if you, if no. you win the netbook, you don't get the t-shirt, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so don't be excited. Brett Esquivel. I apologize if I can't pronounce that. Brett, come on up. Corey, Corey. Oh, no auth Our authentication is lacking in implementation. I apologize. All right, here we go. Mike hit me again. And a punch to the face with Matt T. Matt T, all right, that was for a mug. You can thank Intel. All right. C9H13N. Anyone? Actually, I will give this to you if you can guess their password. Now, now I'm telling you, you have a very good shot of this if you think carefully about what a common password might be. Omit the lead. He said it. He said it. Their password is password. So, for a netbook, you could have had a netbook and. All right, we got. We got a few more what's, slips. What's this for? This is for what are these, Corey? We still, yeah, we still got Tumblr. What is a Tumblr, Corey? <laughs> Travel, mug. Travel mug, okay. We're gonna try to speed this up. Chris? Chris? I'm gonna need a password on this one. Wait, there are two Chris's. I'm seeing two Chris's. We're gonna need Alright. Meanwhile, we're going to draw the next one. He already got one, so. <laughs> Albert K. Callalan? It's a, I apologize. Sorry, Al. All right. Go ahead, Mike. Go for the big one. Go, go. All right. Tim. What is this? Tim? She shifts? Yeah. <laughs> Hey Tim. <laughs> no, one more. Not netbook. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not going to be fair to John. We're going to shake it up. There's barely any left. <laughs> What's this for? This is for one more tumbler or a travel mug. By the way, there's very few correct answers for this. John, you can you can keep both. <laughs> John is well, the most unlucky, unlucky guy. Yeah. All right. Last drawing. Shaking it up. Reaching in. The other. The other Jesse. All right. Hey. Yeah. There you go. All right, everyone, round of applause. Thank you very much for coming out, and uh, I hope you guys have a good DEF CON. Yeah. Yeah.